Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. The hit cast offers a weekly look at Hollywood from a conservative point of view. Sick of media bias infecting Hollywood headlines? Tired of stars insulting your views? Hit has your back. Now, here's your host, Christian Toto. Welcome to episode 96 of the Hollywood and Toto podcast, The Right Take on Entertainment. This week we're speaking with Jonathan Green, director of the powerful new documentary, Social Animals. Yes, it exposes just how frightening social media can be for young people, but you know what? It also shows the entrepreneurial side of the social media realm. This just in this week, Murphy Brown 2.0 is no more. Or is it? I have to say, I saw a bunch of very confusing headlines all throughout the week about the CBS show's reboot. And of course, it's been as anti-Trump as humanly possible. And we're learning that the show will be leaving the air soon after its run of 13 episodes are done. And that was supposedly the plan all along. So how did the media report on it? Welcome to the wide, wide world of fake news and overt bias. On both sides, really. Drudge led the way. The Drudge Report said that the show was being canceled amid historically low ratings. Breitbart News followed suit, again saying the show was canceled. But the show really hasn't been canceled, at least not yet, not technically. Show creator Diane English went to Twitter and said, Hey, we're still alive. We're looking forward to a season two. Well, she's right to a certain extent. The show is technically not canceled. We don't know if that season two is going to happen or not, but... It's just amazing, the whole situation about how a simple news story, and one that doesn't exactly affect the world, it's just a TV show and its possible second season, but it does go to show you what's going on in the media right now, and it's not very good. Now, the show may get the axe sooner than later because the ratings aren't very good. It, isn't, it didn't re, uh, kind of come back the way that Will and Grace did. It didn't certainly match anything close to what Roseanne did when it came back earlier this year. And critics hate it. It sounds absolutely preachy, old school in the very worst way, kind of musty and just old-fashioned and well past its prime. But here's where some other bias sneaks into the situation. A lot of Hollywood media outlets talked about the show and didn't say it was canceled, but also didn't connect the fact that the ratings had been so bad with the fact that it's so anti-Trump. They didn't even mention the anti-Trump spirit of the show, which is inescapable. It's obsessed with Trump. And the people who brought the show back said as much that the fact that Trump is now president is the reason why we're getting Murphy Brown 2.0. But the media didn't want to connect those dots for us. Meanwhile, the show's latest episode has Trump fans beating a liberal reporter and putting him, hurting him so badly he had to go to the hospital. It's exactly what Diane English and all her friends on the left think about Trump fans and what's happening in America these days. But the truth? It's the far-left haters doing far more damage, far more destruction. Just think about one little word, Antifa, and you have your answer. So there you go. The new Murphy Brown is a creative dud for sure. I think very few people disagree with that. And it may get canceled sooner than later. But it's also a sad moment where we can't trust much of anything that we read on the papers, on the web, and that's really tragic. Don't touch that dial. You're listening to my daddy's podcast. Here's the hit tweet of the week. You know, Alyssa Milano has transformed her career in recent times. She hasn't been working a ton. She still gets an occasional gig, but she's far more well-known now for her social activism. Keeps her in the public eye keeps her name in the media's radar. Not so bad, right? And of course, she's aggressively progressive and aggressively anti-Trump. Goes to show. Well, she doesn't quite realize it when she's being owned on Twitter these days. Case in point, she blasted Team Trump like every other celebrity after the Border Patrol used tear gas to defend itself against people trying to break through the so-called migrant caravan. Well, turns out that President Obama, under his watch... The Border Patrol did the same thing time after time after time. So she attempted to play the both sides card to kind of show that she's above all this partisanship. Here's her tweet. 
I don't care who used tear gas, whether it was a blue president or a red president, it is totally un-American. Thanks to all those who have pointed this out to me. We must find humane ways to fix these issues so there's due process for those seeking asylum. Nice try, Alyssa. Your blind partisanship is showing all the same. Well, he's back. Jim Culver is back on the HitCast talking about the Robin Hood debacle and also about why more historical stories aren't being covered by Hollywood. Of course, Jim Culver writes at 3donia.com. Hope you enjoyed this week's conversation. All right, well, Jim, thank you for coming back to the show. And I wanted to touch base with you about the box office results for Robin Hood and sort of the bigger picture here. No pun intended, or maybe pun intended, because it was an absolute flop. I think most people saw it coming. I don't know why the studio didn't, but jump into that a little bit and then talk about why that matters and what we can draw from that. Yeah, so it was a definitely a flop. It was budgeted at about $100 million and opening weekend of $14 million. So Ouch. definitely not going to make its money back. Yeah. Uh, so it just didn't register with people, wasn't popular. Uh, so, you know, obviously the trailer had something to do with that, but, you know, the, the content uh, was, I think, the big driver of that. And, uh, you know, obviously it's a very recycled story. And, uh, you know, we could talk all day about Hollywood and how they're out of ideas, but uh, what they what they've been doing lately to try to be creative is taking an old story like Robin Hood that they've filmed multiple times and try to put a new spin on it and get get creative that way. And in this case, what they essentially tried to do was make it a political allegory for modern times uh, and about the war on terror and and President Trump and things like that. So. Uh, essentially, it starts out with Robin Hood coming home from. I'm just going to kind of give you some background on the story. Comes comes starts with Robin Hood coming home from the Crusades, and uh, effectively discovering that uh, the sheriff of Nottingham is uh, taxing people to fund the war effort over there, and he is uh, justifying that using some very nationalist statements. Uh, one of the things he says is, "Is they." meaning the Muslims hate us for our freedom, which is a direct quote from George W. Bush uh, and uh, other things along those lines, very nationalist, uh, you know, things that are supposed to appeal to people's racism and nationalism and things like that. And uh, he's also in league with an evil cardinal who is uh, secretly funding the war effort on both sides to keep the war going perpetually. Uh, so obviously there's some some big conspiracy theory uh, themes behind it. Uh, so Robin Hood becomes a kind of an Antifa type figure, social <laughs> justice warrior type. Uh, they have him dressed up in uh, all black leather with a hood and a, a mask covering his face, except for his eyes. That, that looks awfully familiar. And he is trained by little John, who is now a black Muslim in this story played by Jamie Foxx. Um, well, this almost so, sounds like a parody of what you expect a movie to be in the 21st century. But. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, and, and, and so I'm, I'm going to just read a quick quote here. This is from uh, Roger Ebert.com, which is a, a far left website. And, uh, uh, this this quote is intended to be a compliment, but <laughs> the quote is, uh, the movie is specifically an anti-organized religion statement as well as an anti-capitalist and anti-nationalist state nationalist statement, a Noam Chomsky editorial with bows and arrows. <laughs> and again, that was intended to be complimentary. So, uh, yeah, so – you know that, that that's the only spin that Hollywood could put on it in 2018 because any kind of more traditional spin would be politically incorrect. Yeah. Uh, so quick note: I think just the property itself, I don't think there's any enthusiasm for it. So I, you know, I think as a conservative, I want to say, oh, all those sort of progressive ideals help sink it, and I don't think it helped. But I just think we didn't have a hunger for this story, and I think no. Hollywood tried to you know, use that brand and then tell their own particular message with it. And I think that was a one-two punch that ultimately doomed it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no question. It was, it was a story that people had heard a million times and then it was badly retold. And that's uh, that's a bad combination right there. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, you know, and obviously the big question is why do we keep hearing these stories over and over again? And uh, there was actually a really good post over at PJ media by, by someone named Tyler O'Neill who, uh, 
you know, essentially asked the question, why are we always getting Robin Hood and King Arthur over and over again and nothing else? And uh, one of the reasons is because those stories are in the public domain, so it costs nothing to adapt them. And another reason is is that they're so well known that it seems like a surefire hit to, to make a movie about them all over again. Uh, but, you know, he makes a good point that there are so many other good stories from history that Hollywood doesn't want to touch. And, uh, you know, he, he brings up a few good options, the Siege of Malta, uh, the Siege of Grenada, uh, certainly some others like the, the Battle of Tripoli, uh, the Battle of Trafalgar, I think, personally, I think is, is an amazing uh, battle story from history. Uh, you know, and I could go on and on with the laund- my own personal laundry list. But, you know, there's so many great stories that, that wouldn't that people would love to see on the big screen. But Hollywood just won't touch them. And uh, part of the reason is that uh, they're not as well known. So obviously they're not going to be – you know, it's it's a riskier proposition. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, Hollywood tried to do the Napoleonic Wars with Master and Commander, which I thought was a fantastic film. I mean it was one of the best movies of the last 20 years. But uh, it didn't make enough money to warrant a sequel. So that's an example of – you know, Hollywood tries to kind of step out of that that little box and, and doesn't always succeed. Um, so that, so that's part of it is risk and Hollywood is not in the risk business right now at all. Uh, and the other reason is that a lot of these stories are kind of politically incorrect because, you know, America usually wins and, um, you know, Hollywood doesn't want to, you know, possibly convey that message that America winning could be a good thing. So, you know, a lot of times, so they're kind of trapped because they either have a story where America wins that they don't want to tell or a story where, you know, America loses and nobody wants to see that. So uh, they're kind of in a box as far as what stories they're willing to tell and what stories they can tell. So their solution is just recycle the same couple of stories that everybody knows over and over again until people stop buying tickets, which is effectively what's happened now. Yeah. You uh, know, one, one other note here is that I think a lot of the stories you're talking about, historically speaking, probably wouldn't come cheap. Uh, they, you know, if there's war, if there's sort of a, an epic scope, I think the dollar goes up. And I think without sort of a superhero brand or, or, or animated brand attached to it, then, then the risk factor is real. And you, you mentioned Master and Commander. I, I just don't, I think epic movies today are, are tougher to sell. And I almost think that what we're talking about might be a better fit on like a Netflix or an Amazon because I think they're more willing to take those risks, let the stories be told, and maybe even spread them out over a few episodes. So that I means sometimes some of these great historical stories need that length, and uh, a movie, a two and a half hour movie, often won't cut it. Absolutely, yeah, they're they're very very expensive, and no, I think you're absolutely right that that these stories are more likely to get told on an Amazon or a Netflix. I, th- those those channels can be kind of kind of PC, so I'm not sure if they would go there, but uh, you know, some some cable channels will do uh, miniseries, like for example, the John Adams miniseries a, a while back. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can be very creative about stretching their budgets and making things look historical and making them look big and epic without spending, you know, $150 million. So yeah, I think a lot of these stories, it's more likely we'll see them uh, on the small screen than the big screen, which personally I'm in favor of seeing them however we can. I think we just need to get them out there because they're, they're really powerful, important stories to tell. But, um, but I think a big part of it is just that, you know, political correctness is just stifling all filmmaking right now. And so it's, you know, there's so many great stories, you know, however you want to tell them, big screen, small screen, whatever, and it just gets shut down because they say, well, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to go there. So, yeah. um, Imagine so if you're I a think screenwriter it's... today, by the way, if you want to make a comedy, you want to make a historical film, and you run into the right. fact that we're living at a time where Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is problematic. It's, it's, it's <laughs> right. handcuffing. And, and if I'm a guy or a gal sitting behind my uh, laptop, I don't even know if I want to get into that. I mean, it's, it's so hard to get a movie made on a good day. And all of a sudden you run into this sort of the PC meat grinder. You probably think, ask the heck with it. I'm going to go in direction B or I'll make that, that, <laughs> that umpteenth Robin Hood reboot because I don't want to go there. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's, you know, I, I re- you really can't overstate how difficult it is to make a successful film, mm-hmm. even if it's you know well made and it's a good story. You just never know whether people are gonna are gonna w- want to go see it. So you know, you, so you've got you know people. It, Hollywood essentially is afraid to do anything original or anything they haven't already done because it's so risky and they can lose their shirts on it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there are opportunities, but they don't want to go near them because. 
you know, so many traditional stories are not fitting into the current narratives that they're trying to push. So, you know, if, you know, effectively you've got, you know, so many opportunities that are, that are being hamstrung by that just unwillingness to go into anything, uh, anything good or creative. So that's why you get, again, you get rehashes and you get franchise films and things like that. And I think people are really hungering for something more than that. I mean, obviously Marvel is doing really well and, and a lot of these films are doing well, but you know, I think people are, are really kind of hungering for new stories and they're just not getting out there. So yeah. And I think if, uh, but, there's a, if there's a, a silver lining here, we won't see a Robin Hood 2 or a King Arthur 2. And I think that's <laughs> that's wonderful and on my end because as a film critic, I, I'm forced to watch most of these films. But uh, well, Jim, any uh, any last thoughts about this before we let you go for the week? Well, I will say just kind of piggybacking on what you just said, there is there is another Arthur movie coming out. Oh. It's actually a, a British uh, – a uh, movie about kids who find the the sort of Excalibur, British kids, and then the, all these creatures and heroes from Arthurian legends start appearing in in the the modern real world, and then the kids have to become knights and fight them off. But so it's it's kind of a weird modern spin on that. But you know, like you say, people have heard, seen the King Arthur story so many times. Uh, but you know, you could you, you know the only way they could have that story is with kids. You couldn't have it with just regular Arthurian heroes because mm. you know that but both that's peace uh, not PC and they, they don't think people would want to see it so it sounds like toxic uh, masculinity to me which I'm already <laughs> exactly just, just by the description exactly. but uh. exactly and yeah and all these all these narratives about toxic toxic masculinity and privilege and all these things and it just it just narrows down the the window of what you can do in storytelling so much that there's almost nothing left so. That's true. And when you go woke, you can never go woke enough, as we've learned in recent. Even the, the new movie Green Book is uh, being attacked on all sides for you know, not being this way, not being that way, the white savior situation. Uh, you know, this, is, this is the palatable version of racism. I, it's exhausting, and it does hurt creativity. So I'm, I'm glad we're, uh, we're punching out against it. But uh, hey, Jim, thanks Absolutely. so much for your help again this week. And of course, where can people find you on the web? Uh, so you can find uh, my posts at threedonia.com, the number three, and uh, yeah, it's a uh, you know it's a fun little site, and uh, yeah, thanks a lot for having me again. I appreciate it. No problem. We will check in with you again down the short, short road as the holidays approach, and I appreciate it. We'll have links to that Tyler O'Neill article you reference, and also to threedonia.com at the show notes page at hollywoodintoto.com. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. You're listening to the Hollywood in Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. My hit tip of the week is The Night Eats the World. It's a zombie movie, but wait, there's more. Not more zombies or more gore, mind you. The emphasis here isn't on that kind of action. It's more philosophical in a way. The film follows a young man who goes to a party, has a rift with his ex-girlfriend, ends up sleeping at the apartment complex where the party's being held. And when he wakes up, well, there's no one there. While he was slumbering, a zombie apocalypse broke out and everyone seems to be gone. Except, of course, the zombies who are walking around outside and trying to get into this, the apartment complex where he's located. So he's barricaded himself in. And now, well, now what? What does he do? How does he live? How does he take care of himself? How does he entertain himself? That's the crux of the movie. So if you're a big horror fan and you like gore and action, all sorts of in, in, you know, guts-chomping zombies, this is not really for you. But if that concept alone intrigues you, I would definitely recommend it. It's interesting. It's not a great movie, but it's thoughtful. And uh, I just love the fact that the zombie genre has so many sides to it. You think, okay, it's zombies. It's the end of the world. It's the apocalypse. You know, just lather, rinse, repeat. But more and more times you're seeing zombie movies with some intelligence and some sophistication and uh, I- i'm very glad to see all that the night eats the world offers a really smart take on survival instincts and just how we process the kind of massive grief that would go along with something of this colossus perspective he's one person he's trapped and he's got to pass the time that's why this movie is so interesting and that's why i recommend the night eats the world available right now on amazon prime Now let's get to this week's HeadCast interview. Are you the parent of an Instagram-obsessed teen? Director Jonathan Green's Social Animals is just for you. Actually, not only for you, though. It's for everybody who's really curious about social media and what it can do to our culture and to the people who use it so very often. The new documentary is available right now for pre-order on iTunes before its December 11th digital release. It follows three young people on Instagram. 
One's an aspiring businesswoman who happens to be beautiful and fit and very photogenic, and she's got a huge following. Another is an urban photographer just trying to forge his brand online, kind of spread out and finding some complications along the way. The third person is a young girl who sees the very worst side of social media. Now, Green brings a really interesting background to this project. He works in media a lot. This is his directorial debut. But I think the fact that he's so enmeshed in the media give him a, it gives him a real edge when it comes to telling the story. It doesn't follow the usual beats. It gets very ingrained in what's going on with these particular people. But it also shows that social media can be good and bad and sometimes in between. It just depends how you use it and how other people use it as well. It's a fascinating movie. I highly recommend it. Here's my chat with filmmaker Jonathan Green. Well, Jonathan, thank you for joining the show. Uh, one of the, I've got so many questions about your film, and I want to start with selecting the subjects here because I think it's an intriguing group of young people, but obviously finding them isn't easy. And I just got curious your, your the thought process behind finding people like them, and and what was what was foremost in your mind when you were selecting them. Well, you know, they're they're very different characters. Obviously, they they share so little in common, with the exception of the Instagram played some big role in their life. Um, and so that's kind of what we're looking for is very diverse stories that that would be the only kind of common thread and to, to represent different geographics. We really found each one of them through very different means. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're very fortunate to, to find them. Gotcha. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's so many scary elements about your film and that's not your fault. It's just the way social media is. You know, there's depression, there's life-threatening situations. When you think about social media after making this movie, what what scares you the most about its impact on the culture? Well, I think, I mean, obviously we went out, we set out and hopefully achieved making a film that wasn't against social media, but we're just trying to be honest with some of the complications and, and challenges there are. I think if I was to say what scares me the most, it's not, it's not like a, um, threats or bullying per se. I think it's, um, I think it's probably this, um, reduction in like true empathy that I believe comes with using social media as a primary forms of communication because it's all done through a screen versus face to face. And I think in balance, that's fine. But I think when it comes, becomes like the main way that young people or adults are communicating, then we kind of become disembodied and we lose those cues of empathy that we can get face to face. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, that it, that does jump out at me as well. And not that, you know, you kind of mentioned that it's not just the negative, but it's, there's a lot of positive aspects of social media. I mean, some of the, the young woman featured here was a dancer and, and a model, and she's in, in a way kind of channeling this energy and this potential into a potentially lucrative future. Uh, that amazes me. I mean, I guess you can go back to the Justin Bieber becoming famous based on his YouTube clips. I think that uh, in a way, social media is an extension of the internet where the internet gives you these amazing resources and then the social media is like almost like a, another layer of potential that you could tap into. Talk about that side of things. I, I, I think the scary stuff does get more attention and we definitely want to talk about it, but that element is, is so intriguing to me. I think it, it's, it's kinda, it kind of democratizes the whole process. Well, and that's exactly what I was going to use. I think, I think with, um, as technology has, you know, obviously the innovation cycle has been so drastic over the last 15, 20 years and the internet has been integrated into every part of business and personal life and all these things and social media kind of being the most, um, personal way that tech, especially in the fact that it's with us all the time in our smartphones, it's like the most personal that, the digital world has ever gotten for the individual. And I think, you know, technology's always democratized different things. It's democratized, you know, journalism by allowing there to be blogs and little tiny things that would never have had a voice or been part of the public conversation. What I think social media does, um, among other things, is it democratizes audience. And so what you have is someone like a Justin Bieber or someone obviously much smaller like Kaylin, who's in our film, who she may have been able to have some influence, win some dance competitions, but because of social media, she's able to have a much bigger audience because she no longer needs to go through these gatekeepers of audience and reach that someone might have like a television station, for instance, or a producer, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And the same is true for Humza, the other character who would have never probably 
to his own telling of the story. He might not have ever made it off the four blocks of the of the projects that he grew up in Queens, except that he was able to find like minded people that are doing interesting things, but also find an audience that allowed his impact and his influence to grow way quicker than it could have in, in a different environment. I think one of the great things about your film, and I, I, it's a kind of film, even though the language is a little salty, teen wise, typical stuff. But I, I think that we need as a culture to learn about how to process and deal with and how to live with social media. And I think a lot of teens today don't have that education. I think a lot of parents are kind of strangers in a strange land. Do you, do you get the sense or do you have any sense of our culture maybe bringing that into the discussion, maybe high schools? Are, are they talking about social media? Do they have lectures about it? Do they have maybe speakers coming to school? I feel like we really need that and that if kids and parents enter this world without any kind of a guide, that it's really troublesome potentially. Yeah, and I think that was one of our goals in making the film was not to make, as we said already, you know, a film that's that's against social media or for it, like with no reservations, but rather to make something that hopefully stirs a rich conversation, mm -hmm. um, you know, among teens, among leaders in schools and, and teachers and, and most especially between teenagers and their parents. I don't think there's always, um, you know, tools or encouragement for, for parents to have ongoing conversations. Sometimes like tell your kids about this, tell your kids about that. What we were trying to do with this is to create something that would be entertaining and interesting to both a teen and a parent and hopefully organically allow them to reach certain topics that they may not have addressed explicitly before. Mm -hmm. you, you work in media and marketing, and this is your first feature film. And I'm sure when you enter this project, you, you had some ideas about what social media was, what Instagram was, the impact, the good, the bad. We, after it's all said and done, the film is out. It's you know it's it's about to be released. What did what do you think was the biggest learning experience for you? What did you kind of what was the most interesting thing that you didn't know when you entered the project that you really feel like you have a pretty good handle on right now? Yeah, it's a great question. I think probably it's less it's less been like a big aha moment of oh I didn't know that, and it's more been a slow realization over the course of making this film that as we reflect back, I think just you know, we talked to 50 plus teenagers and interviewed them and sat down and heard their stories. And it was less about, oh, just a, a fact of how many kids are doing this or how many kids are doing that. It became personal. And I think one in over that process, the thing that I that I internalized, maybe that I hadn't before when they were just numbers or statistics, is that they don't make a distinction between, oh, I have my digital life and my personal, my real, my quote unquote real life. It's all their real life and it's just expressing it. It's being expressed in these different ways. It's being expressed at school, you know, uh, in the hallways and classrooms and most especially digitally. And I think the way and the degree to which it's integrated into every part of their lives it was very pronounced as we talked to all these kids, those big moments of formation, those big moments of, of that will look, they'll look back later as an adult and say that shaped me. So many of those are now happening digitally and they don't see that as, as um, not valid or they don't see that as like, it didn't really happen because it was digitally. It's just as valid. and It's just as pronounced. Gotcha. When, when you think about uh, parents who watch the film, my kids are seven and nine, so we're not there yet although they're sort of the screen time is an issue. What do you want parents to take away from this film? If you could sort of, if you can have a one-on-one -on -one with a mom or a dad and they've got teens who are just entering the, the social media landscape, what, what would you talk about or want to talk about? You know, I think it's kind of what we touched on a second ago. It's, it's hopefully that the parent, the takeaway is that we need that this is complicated. It's, it's easy to put it in a box and say, don't go near that. It's all bad. Or it's easy to, to just say like, oh, it's fine. They're just kids being kids. And I think that middle ground is maybe the more prudent place to be, which is, you know, it's complicated. There's lots of nuances to it. it we can't, it's, we can't oversimplify mm -hmm. uh, the role of social media in teenagers' lives. And so we do need to have not just one, not just two, but ongoing conversations about how these things work. And honestly, like parents need to not just be talking to their kids about it. They need to be modeling it. Like hopefully we made a movie that's you know that on the face is about teenagers but it it should apply to all of us that are on social media it certainly apply to me as i i see myself and some of my behaviors reflected in what these teenagers are doing gotcha
That's a good point. I think it's one of the most powerful things about parenting is the modeling factor. And when I'm on the phone or on my Twitter too much, I definitely think twice about it. But uh, yeah. we're talking with Jonathan Green, director of the fascinating new film, Social Animals. It's available December 11th on most digital platforms. You can pre-order it now on iTunes. So definitely look into that. Uh, you made a documentary and you know there's no big stars here. The budget's not huge. And the marketplace is just so full of content. And I, I just, I, I kind of, there's so many great creators out there, and it's just so hard to be heard and to get your voice out there. And obviously, you and I are talking, and that'll help spread the word about it. But just as a filmmaker, do you get sort of knee deep in the process of marketing? Do you kind of help beyond an interview here or there, to getting the word out there? And how hard is that challenge? Because I just, I just, I mean, I can't even watch all the great content out there now. And I'm just thinking, if you've yeah. got your such heart and soul invested in a project like you do with this film. It, it makes it even harder. Yeah, it definitely is. And I think, you know, we, we were fortunate enough um, to get um, accepted into In Competition, which one of only 10 documentaries receives in South by Southwest, which is one of the bigger film festivals domestically. And that got us a lot of exposure and, and like some great reviews. And we've now got, you know, 86% on Rotten Tomatoes from all the reviews that we've gotten. So there are those ways, even as a small independent filmmaker, that you can that you know we've been fortunate to to have some of that exposure. But it's obviously an ongoing process to try to to try to pierce through all the noise and all the options of what people have to watch. Um, and we we've been because we're also a marketing agency, like we we've done a very hands on approach, but um, with some of those efforts. But you know, interviews like this and others um, to get the word out has been the main way that we've tried to. To, to let people know about the work we've done and, and hopefully about the film that could, could be enriching for them. When I was growing up, and I guess that maybe even like the late 70s, early 80s, if you're watching a low-budget movie or a small-budget movie, you could see it. It just looked grainy. The acting wasn't good. <laughs> There's a million different reasons why the, the content from that era was just maybe substandard, even though there was a lot of heart and soul behind it. When I think about it, like your film, like your film looks good. It's clear. It's crisp. It's got a kind of a nice visual pacing. Uh, talk a little bit about sort of what, as an artist, uh, any influences that kind of maybe helped shape your vision or, or how you kind of saw what you wanted to capture? Because it, it definitely has a very appealing, before you even accept the, what you're seeing or hearing, it just looks good. I was just kind of curious as, as, a, as a visual storyteller what, what your approach is. Yeah, and thank you. I mean, I think our first jumping off point inspiration-wise was the kind of aesthetic that's been formed on Instagram itself very symmetrical, like the things that get, you know, and they say, Oh, that's very Instagram. Like there's almost an aesthetic that's inherent and built into the DNA of Instagram. Mm -hmm. It's kind of made photographers out of everyone, right? You have these great filters and people are now like making sure the shot is symmetrical and those kinds of things. So we let that inform it. And then I think just a lot of great, both narrative and documentary filmmakers that, that I like and trying to find, visuals that can tell the story so it's not just talking heads it's not just people explaining but you're seeing you know you're feeling um the story visually as well mm -hmm. you, you did the film festival circuit with south by southwest is sort of a jumps out at me it's one of the biggest in the country w what do you learn as a filmmaker through that process i know it's a lot of pressure it's social it's fun it's uh i'm sure it's kind of a once in a lifetime experience in a way or maybe hopefully more as your future films come out but w what do you take away from that whole ride uh, it, 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 if as a storyteller, as a marketer, as just a fan of film, what, what kind of uh, the lessons there? Yeah, I mean, South by Southwest was an amazing experience. And I think, um, I mean, there's so many takeaways. I mean, it was one of the, it was a great week for our team to get to go and celebrate the film and just get to see a community, the film community, not just the filmmaking community, but the film going community mm -hmm. that supports independent cinema and get to go and celebrate a number of films that many of which have distribution, some of which don't. And I think for us, it was just, um, yeah, it was definitely one of those like look back, um, moments that we're super privileged to have, have gotten to have with this film. And it, it just inspires us to keep making cinema, whether it's a big, you know, whether it's on a big stage with a studio and, and lots of money or whether it's a small, passion project there is an audience for good cinema and it can rise to the top even if you don't have a big budget mm -hmm. that's yeah, one of the great things about what we're living through now is i think the kind of the uh, niching down is you think it's maybe obscure at times certain topics not particularly your film i think it's got your film's got wide appeal frankly but i think a lot of films seem like they've got a smaller crowd but 
there's a smaller crowd out there, and they've got a, they've got a hunger, and they've got an appetite, and a curiosity, and they're they're eager to see it. Well, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, it goes back to kind of what we were saying about audience. I think even for film, there's a democratization of audience that's happened because of the the era, the internet era that we're living in, where you know, yeah, being at a film festival, but that's only a few hundred people. Mm-hmm. But the fact that you can distribute digitally, you don't have to have been, been in theaters to get a massive audience. I mean, that's part of that democratization of audience that we've seen on social media, and it obviously applies to cinema. Yeah, when Martin Scorsese is debuting his next film on Netflix, you know, all the rules have changed, and it's a whole new landscape. Yeah, when and you, the Coen brothers. That's right. Did, yeah. Just did their Netflix, yeah. That's amazing. Uh, what's next for you? When you've got a first film under your belt, I'm sure that helps you, I would think, uh, with the next project. Do you have something that's sort of in the works, almost ready? Where do you go next as a filmmaker? Yeah, I mean, we have a number of projects. We were able, like, as a company to kind of put a stake in the ground and say, hey, this is just going to be the first of multiple. And so what we've been really doing over the last few months is developing lots of different projects, both documentary and scripted projects. On the documentary side, we have two that are kind of getting some traction that um, I won't go into detail about now, but they're both kind of true crime, human interest character stories. Um, there's obviously a big op- appetite for true crime, but it's also something we're, we're very interested in. Mm-hmm. That it's a huge, huge area too. It's just with the uh, the making murderer from Netflix. One last question: Your company is Conscious Minds, and it's dubbed a content agency. And I have a sense of what that is, but I want you to describe it because I just it feels like that's the kind of company that that in a sense didn't exist 20 years ago. I just think that everything is changing, and the landscape is so is so uh, evolving what give me give me the breadth of work that you do with there and and what maybe uh kind of projects that we might not expect from you yeah i mean basically as a as a it is true it's it's kind of a new um a new paradigm for content creation is that the basically it used to be in kind of traditional advertising you have agencies in one place and they're coming up with the ideas and the strategy and the campaign and even like writing the t- the TV commercial scripts, and then you have a production company that's submitting directors to kind of how their their vision to how they execute those commercials. And what we do, it be, and again, uh, in part because there is so much content being distributed by brands um, on different social platforms and and digitally on the internet, we create a lot of different kinds of content that that is TV commercials, but it's also short documentaries or or Instagram content and. We kind of have under one roof a lot of that ideation, but then also that execution. So for one of our clients, one of our main clients is Nike. We do tons of storytelling and activations for them. And it'll be for, you know, we did the two out of the first three videos on Nike's IGTV channel. Mm -hmm. Um, And those are, you know, athlete stories. And so we're coming up and finding those stories and, and helping shape that narrative and then actually going out and shooting it. Wow. As a creator, that sounds like a dream come true. You get to have your fingers in so many pies. Uh, th- thanks again, Jonathan, for joining the HitCast. Please look out for his new film, Social Animals. It's hitting digital platforms December 11th, but you can pre-order it right now on iTunes. And uh, it's a good film. It's an interesting film. It'll make you think. And I do like the fact that you balance between the sort of the darker side and a lot of the creative potential there. It's an amazing service, and I, I just feel like as a culture, we've just kind of scratched the surface. But uh, thanks again. I really appreciate your time, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out HollywoodandToto.com for both the show notes and, of course, the latest entertainment news. Please follow me at Twitter at Hollywood and Toto. And we'd love it if you leave a podcast review over at iTunes. See you next week.